Good morning, everybody. Now, if you haven't said good morning to the person sitting next to you already, would you tell them how glad you are to see them today? I don't know about you all, but this has been, yesterday was very exciting. We want to thank Gallaudet again for their hospitality. We want to thank them for whatever role they played in making sure we had the right kind of weather for this event. We didn't have to worry about umbrellas running across the campus and et cetera. And we also want to thank them for the opportunity for us to make new connections as we continue to try to live out the theme of where, where do we go from here? The work that we're doing here is very important work. It's very personal work. And my challenge to each of you is to help people get to the place to be intentional about interfaith and community service, to be intentional about making personal commitments beyond what you may be required to do because of your job title or the role that you play on your campus, but because you've connect connected your head and your heart together, and you know it's just the right thing to do. So we're gonna have several opportunities for you to take other steps that you might not have thought about, and one of those is that we're gonna connect you and give you the opportunity to connect yourself to Faith and Peace, which is being presented by one of our international guests. And it's a simple opportunity. How many of you can do this? If you can do this, come on. This is the elementary school teacher in me. So you get a chance to take a picture showing the Dove of Peace sign, and your picture will become many of hundreds of thousands of pictures that just say, I believe in peace. There will be signs, and forms actually in the back, but we're hoping that you'll use the URL, go online, use the technology, and do what needs to be done to sign up and be a partner, an ambassador for peace in this space. And one of our attendees here, Javier, has presented this opportunity. I just want you all to thank him for having the foresight to do something that invites all of us to participate. Where do we go from here? What will you do? What can we do? And how do we answer the question, how can I help? And I believe that it's the way we live out the things we talk about. It's what people see us do more than what they hear us say that matters in transforming the way people live their lives. This morning, we're going to be honored with our opening remarks from the Secretary of Education, Dr. John King. John King officially joined us as Secretary in January, January the 1st of 2016, but he'd been working in the deputy capacity and what I want you to know about John that you might not have read is that his life story is what motivated him to become involved in education. Who would have ever dreamt that this young man who came from the background, the experiences that he had uh, endured, would one day be holding the highest position in the nation at the Department of Education as our secretary. I'm hoping that in his remarks, he will share a little of his personal narrative because you never know that somebody sitting out there is still saying, what can I do and how will I do it? And you may find the partner, the friend, the connection that you need right in this space today. I cannot overemphasize to you how important it is to tell your story because you never know when your story will help somebody else find the way to the story that changes their lives. The secretary has arrived. So I want you to do something that I won't ask you to do anymore today. But John King has stepped into a very difficult space he stepped in as Secretary Duncan was leaving, and together they sent a letter to all education leaders across the nation. In that letter, they said, we need your help in creating welcoming communities, places where young people are safe, 
places where everybody knows that all means all, that we're striving for equity and opportunity for everyone. And so in this space, help me create a welcoming environment for our Secretary of Education, John King. Welcome him, if you will. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Brenda, for that warm and rousing introduction. Uh, Brenda is a blessing, a blessing to the department and a blessing in this world. Can we have a round of applause for Brenda? So grateful to her and to her team for making this event possible and all the work that it takes to make an event like this a success. Uh, I just want to share a bit this morning about my enthusiasm and the president's enthusiasm about the work that you are doing and situate the work in the, in the context of what is, we must acknowledge, a challenging moment for the country. Um, certainly the events, even of this week, the violence that we see, uh, the discord that we see reminds us of the urgency of the service in which you all are engaged and the work that we must do as a country to ensure that we have the hard conversations around issues of race and class and our history as a country and that we not just have the conversation but turn that conversation into action to make our society more just. Certainly college is a place where students are in a period of exploration whether they are first arriving at college fresh from high school as young people or whether they are returning to college as adults trying to improve their skills and advance their family in the economy. But it's also an opportunity, college is also an opportunity for our students to reflect on their place in the world, to build relationships with new peers and to develop a sense of connection to others across lines of race, class, religion, language, even country. It's an opportunity for folks to be a part of a learning community and then to engage in service and to engage in service that deepens the, their learning. The president created the Interfaith and Community Service Campus Challenge because he believes that our college students can have tremendous impact on the challenges that we face in our communities. He also believes that diversity is a strength of our country and that service is a way that we can engage meaningfully with that diversity and bring together diverse student populations to work together on behalf of the broader community. 2011, the president said, an act of service can unite people of different backgrounds around a common purpose of helping those in need. In doing so, we can not only better our communities, we can also build bridges of understanding between ourselves and our neighbors. And because all of you are engaged in that work, I want to express my gratitude on behalf of the country for the work that you are doing to build on our diversity and to strengthen our communities. There are so many great examples of work that's happening on campuses across the country, strengthening ties ac across boundaries and making communities better. I think of the work that's happening at University of Southern California where 10 interfaith ambassadors have educated 40 local public high school students about religion in a year-long course that includes experiential learning and hands-on learning opportunities. Think of the work at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania where 200 students have engaged in uh, relief work around Hurricane Sandy, contributing over 1,600 hours of service, uh, collecting money for the Red Cross, and making 14 trips to do hands-on uh, recovery work. I think of the work that's happening at Belmont University in Nashville, where students have dedicated uh, two nights a week over five winter months to cook for homeless men and women to spend time with them and to provide them with warmth and shelter at the university's sports science center. Think of the work at Bristol Community College in Fall River, Massachusetts, where as many as 300 volunteers of diverse ages and backgrounds set up 
and deliver uh, free food benefiting up to 1,200 people per month. And they've also held convenings about why we serve to, to lift up the conversation about community service. And there are so many more examples in this room from places that are working on issues of environmental justice, places that have created community gardens and are hosting food banks to tackle the challenge of food insecurity, uh, folks who are developing curricula to support uh, student learning in K through 12 education and in higher education, folks who are engaged in mentoring work that, that both helps young people and first generation college students to find success. This work is deeply important and Today is really, this convening is really about celebrating that work and building on it. We know that service can be transformative. Brenda mentioned the role of service in my life. For me, this conversation is deeply personal. I grew up in New York City, in Brooklyn. My mom passed away when I was eight in October of my fourth grade year. I live with my dad who was quite sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. And home was this place that was, from one night to the next, scary and unpredictable. I didn't know what my father was going to be like. I didn't know what home was going to be like. I can recall one night uh, where he woke me up at 2 in the morning and said it was time to go to school. And I remember clinging to the banister of the staircase in our house saying, no, Daddy, it's not time to go to school. It's the middle of the night. And not understanding why he was saying it was time to go to school. And, and when I would sit in class, I would worry about what was going to happen at home. Was he okay? What was tonight going to be like? And I didn't understand it. Then he passed away when I was 12. I moved around between family members and schools. And through all of that period, the thing that saved my life, the reason I'm standing here today, the reason I do the work that I do, is New York City public teachers, New York City public school teachers. New York City public school teachers who could have looked at me and said, here's an African-American, Latino, male, student, family in crisis. What chance does he have? And given up on me. But instead, chose to invest in me, chose to give me hope about the future. They made school a place that was interesting and compelling and engaging. From doing Shakespeare in elementary school, to reading the New York Times every day, to going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and the ballet. New York City public school teachers opened up a world to me beyond Canarsie, Brooklyn. Those experiences, that's right. Those experiences allowed me not only to survive that period of my life, but to find meaning in school and to find hope about what I could accomplish after school. And it wasn't easy, and it wasn't a straight line path. I often, I often tell folks I believe I'm the first Secretary of Education to have been kicked out of high school. Um, but, but, I, but, I hope, but I hope that I won't be the last. And I say that to say it would be easy to say, you know, I had such powerful early education experiences, and then it was all set. But actually it wasn't. As a teenager, I was angry and hurt and frustrated and struggled in my relationship with adult authority and got in trouble because of, of working through the experiences I had as a child. And I got kicked out of high school and again, folks could have given up on me. They could have said, well, he had his shot. But instead, folks gave me a second chance. One of the reasons I am so committed to our administration's work on second chances. I believe deeply that folks can get better, can make a decision to change their lives. And I was fortunate to have an uncle who uh, had been a Tuskegee Airman who I went to live with after I got kicked out of high school. And my uncle, who's career Air Force, said to me very directly, I can't do anything about the things that happened to you in your life as a child. And you can't either. But you can decide today what kind of man you want to be, what kind of life you want to lead. And that was a powerful conversation that helped set me back on the right path. And I was fortunate to, to, to go on to, to Harvard College. And at Harvard, one of the things that, I, that shaped the rest of my career was engaging in public service. Harvard has a long-standing com community service organization called Phillips Brooks House Association. It is one of the oldest student-led 
campus public service organizations. And I didn't know it at the time, but getting involved as a freshman, getting involved in the work at, at Phillips Rooks House was an opportunity for me to try to pay forward what New York City public school teachers, what my uncle had done for me. And so I got involved in running after school programs and running a summer camp in a public housing development uh, in Boston, Mission Maine public housing development that at the time was the largest uh, open air crack market in, in New England. And we lived in the community and ran a summer camp there and worked with young people there and built relationships with families there. I got, had the opportunity to teach civics and, and Boston Public Schools, and those experiences shaped the direction of my life. I became a teacher and a principal because I found such satisfaction in the experience as a college student of trying to be of service, trying to make the kind of difference in other kids' lives that people had made in my own. And so to this day, the work I do in education is deeply shaped by those experiences that I had at Phillips Brooks House as an undergraduate committed to service that were really an extension of trying to give back and pay forward what others had done for me. So this work that you do is deeply personal. So I want to, I want to deliver two messages. One is we've got to keep having faith and hope for every child regardless of their circumstances. Yeah. We, we, that's right. We cannot give up. We cannot give up on any child. And the second is we, we must continue this work, this work of service, this work of bringing communities together around service, undaunted by the challenges we face in our current moment in the country. What will make our country better, what will heal our wounds, what will overcome our challenges, what will bring people together will be the work that you do, will be the work of uh, lifting up our common humanity and our common responsibility to be of service to others. So I want to thank you again for the work that you do. Uh, thank you again for your leadership and wish you a great rest of the conference. Thanks so much. Wow, don't forget to tell somebody your story. The theme for today's presentations are um, what works in interfaith and the academy. Our next presenter is Dahlia Magahed, who is the director of research at the Research Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. She was also formerly the executive director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies. She holds the distinction of having been a member of the first President's uh, Council for the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships work as well. So would you welcome her now and as she comes to lead us into our morning's reflections, make sure that if you have questions forming that you write your questions down throughout the day and at a point uh, when we have our panel, you'll have an opportunity to have your questions shared. Thank you very much, and welcome now, Dahlia Magahed, as she leads us into the next portion of our program. Good morning. Thank you so much for that, and I, I was personally, as a parent, as, as an American, so moved by the Secretary's remarks. Uh, it's hard to to go after that. Uh, my talk today will be uh, a reflection on my own experience on the President's Advisory Council briefly, but then a discussion of something that our country is facing that I think uh, interfaith service is the key solution to. I'm gonna talk to you this morning about Islamophobia and why I believe it is a threat to every single American. Can I get some technical uh, help over here? <laughs> it's... All right. So let 
me at least start with um, some brief reflections on, on my experience. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, serving on the President's Advisory Council in 2009. It was the inaugural um, council. In fact, I served with my colleague and friend, Dr. Ibu Patel, and one thing that was so inspiring that first year is how the president made interfaith service such a priority. He, he called the nation to service that very first summer. Uh, and, and I had the pleasure of, of leading a campaign among American Muslims of answering the president's call to service. So I'm going to very briefly talk about what is Islamophobia. Um, why is there so much today? the impact it has on every American and what we can do about it. So Islamophobia is simply anti-Muslim bigotry or discrimination. A lot of people believe and, and claim that Islamophobia started and is because of 9-11 or is, is primarily because of uh, terrorism. Of course, terrorism that is carried out by Muslims in the name of Islam is a huge uh, issue and no, no trivializing that. But surprisingly, anti-Muslim sentiment does not follow, spikes in anti-Muslim sentiment does not follow terrorist attacks. In fact, when you look at 9-11, anti-Muslim sentiment actually went down slightly after 9-11 as compared to right before. So terrorist attacks in and of themselves don't explain the rise of Islamophobia. Where anti-Muslim sentiment actually does spike is not around domestic terrorist attacks or even overseas violence, but instead around election cycles and in the run-up to the Iraq war. So, Rather than being the organic response to bad behavior on the part of Muslims, in many ways, Islamophobia is a manufactured tool of public manipulation. It's also an industry. There are several reports now documenting an actual industry manufacturing fear. Um, between 2008 and 2013, more than $200 million went into funding anti-Muslim material and, and uh, activists in the United States. So again, it's not organic, it is a manufactured phenomenon. Media coverage. Sometimes I, I will uh, comment that with this kind of media coverage, it's not a wonder why there's Islamophobia, but rather why there isn't more of it. So one study found that 80% of news media, I just heard, in fact, an update to that study, it's now 90% of news media about Islam and Muslims is negative. Now that compares to 73% of news media about North Korea being negative, a country that has actually openly uh, threatened the United States. According to another study, over the past 25 years, coverage of Islam in the New York Times, uh, a very elite paper that we often believe is, is if anything, um, liberal, coverage of Islam is more negative than coverage of cancer and cocaine. So why is there Islamophobia? Because there is an immeasurable media bias. So what is the impact on society? Well, it makes us less safe and less free. First, the way it makes us less safe is Muslim Americans. Let's start with the obvious. Muslim Americans report more religious discrimination than any other faith group with one in five, almost one in five, reporting regular experience discrimination. Among Muslim Americans, the most vulnerable are women, young people, and those without a college education. So the most vulnerable in the community are the most, uh, the most targeted. 
The other problem, though, with Islamophobia is it doesn't just stop at Muslims. It opens the psychological space to other types of bigotry. So there is an actual empirical link between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Someone who has anti-Semitic views is 32 times as likely to also be Islamophobic. But it doesn't stop at religious minorities. It also expands to other types of minorities, other ethnic groups. There is an 80% overlap between lawmakers that are proposing anti-Muslim legislation and those proposing legislation that curtails the rights of other groups, including African Americans and Latinos, women, the LGBTQ community, labor, as well as immigrants. But even if you're not a member of any of those groups, Islamophobia affects you because it's fueled by fear, and fear kills freedom. When we are afraid on a neurological level, we are more accepting of authoritarianism, conformity, and prejudice. It also makes us less safe. First, again, the obvious, it is linked to a rise in hate crimes against Muslims and those perceived to be Muslims. But it also strengthens terrorist rhetoric. Terrorists are using Islamophobic, Islamophobic rhetoric in our country to recruit, to actually make propaganda videos and, and use them against us. Islamophobia also alienates young people and can open the psychological space to, to actually hear those propaganda messages. This is just one example, an actual video uh, made taking our own um, rhetoric in our elections and using it to recruit people to terrorist organizations. It is that, it is that closely linked. So Muslims are perhaps the first to feel it, but they are like canaries in the coal mine. The climate of fear and bigotry is toxic and hurting everyone. So what do we do about it? And this is where really the work of, of this campaign and this initiative is so important, interfaith service is one of the most powerful ways to help people come together and get to know each other. And that's what makes me so proud to introduce my friend, my colleague, Dr. Ibu Patel. Ibu is not only a, a best-selling author, an inspiring leader, but a wonderful father and husband. And it's with the utmost pleasure that I give you, Ibu Patel. Thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. Thank you, Secretary King. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you to the whole team who put this together. A very special thanks to Gallaudet University, our hosts. I have to tell you, uh, walking around a campus, seeing people, of a variety of racial, ethnic, religious, gender, sexuality backgrounds, speaking to each other in this eloquence has been a major learning for me, and I will never forget it. So it's nice to meet you, and I appreciate you. There's this great story about uh, three people all laying bricks. Somebody goes up to the first person and says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying bricks. Second person, he says, I'm building a wall. Third person, she says, I'm erecting a cathedral. I think that that's a useful metaphor for what we're doing when it comes to interfaith cooperation. If you think of it in the widest possible and most poetic frame, we're erecting a cathedral called a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. And it's a lot harder than you might think. Why is that? Because democracy is not just a place where people vote for their elected representatives. Democracy is a place where people get to make their personal, 
private identities and convictions public. Diversity is not just the differences you like. It's also the differences you don't like. It's deep, deep disagreement. Religion, as the great theologian Paul Tillich said, is about ultimate concerns. So what's a religiously diverse democracy? It is a place where people who have deep disagreements on matters of ultimate concern can make those disagreements public. No wonder there's so much conflict, tension, and turmoil in religiously diverse democracies. What does it, make to make, what does it mean to make that kind of society our society? and increasingly societies all over the world, what does it mean to take that situation, that volatile situation, and make it healthy, inch it towards cooperation rather than conflict? I think it means to have a vision of a society where people's differences, including the ones you are uncomfortable with, people's differences are respected, where people have relationships between different communities, and where people have a vision of the common good. How do you build that kind of a society? How do you erect that cathedral? Well, you do it brick by brick. It doesn't just fall from the sky. It gets built program by program, interfaith dialogue by interfaith dialogue, personal conversation by personal conversation. And who lays those bricks in the shape to form the cathedral? People do. Leaders do, interfaith leaders. Interfaith leaders with the vision, the knowledge base, and the skill set to make cathedrals a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. And where do those interfaith leaders get that vision, that knowledge base, and that skill set? Where do they get the original inspiration and nurturing? On college campuses, on places that are effectively mini cathedrals of religiously diverse democracies searching, seeking, pining towards healthiness. Places that are able to offer freshman orientation programs that say, listen, here you are gonna meet people who orient around differently, more widely than you've ever met before. And you're gonna have to learn how to assert your own identity, affirm their right to theirs, build a relationship, and do something in common together. Places that can require diversity courses and include case studies around religious diversity. Campuses that can say, in any profession you are likely to go into, whether it's diplomacy or medicine, you are gonna need interfaith leadership skills. On this campus, you ought to minor in interfaith studies. You ought to practice those skills by starting a Better Together campaign. Colleges are effectively mini cathedrals of healthy, religiously diverse democracies preparing leaders who built the larger and more magnificent cathedral called a nation that is a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. The theme of this gathering is where do we go from here? It also happens to be the title of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s last book, 1967 book called Where Do We Go From Here? chaos or community. You might feel that we're living in that moment right now. I certainly do sometimes. And in that book, Dr. King has this really beautiful image, this beautiful story that he calls the World House story. And I imagine this World House like, like this cathedral. And Dr. King says, imagine that you're in this family and you have received a letter one day saying that one of your ancestors has died and has left you this great world house. But the catch is this, that lots of other people have received this letter. <laughs> the ancestor in the Muslim tradition, it's Prophet Adam. May the peace and blessings of God be upon him. We are that entire family. We have all received this letter. You get to live in this world house. You get to move in. But the catch is, there's other people there, people with different identities. And King says, in this world house, there are black folks and white folks, Easterners and Westerners. And then he goes and names a variety of different religious orientations. There are Protestants and Catholics. There are Muslims and Buddhists. There are Gentiles and Jews. And because we can never again live apart, we need to learn how to live together in peace. 
the thing that strikes me about the United States of America is that we're the first experiment in diverse democracy. Great political philosopher Michael Walzer has a book called What It Means to Be an American, in which he says, you know, for generations, centuries actually, political philosophers thought that the only way you could have diversity was under a dictatorship. If you wanted democracy, everybody had to be of a single ethnicity, race, or religion, because how would people of one religion allow for, the representative, allow for a different religious group to elect their representative and live under that individual's rule? He writes this whole section on this, and then he ends the section with the line, until the United States of America. The first country to think that you could bring together people from the four corners of the earth people speaking different languages with different customs, praying to God in different ways, including not at all, and they could have a common project called a country. And that challenge is now spread all over the world. What does it mean to build that cathedral, to nurture a critical mass of interfaith leaders on our college campuses with the inspiration and the vision, the knowledge base and the skill set, to run those programs, those dialogues, those interfaith service activities, those conversations that laid the bricks to build a cathedral, this world house of a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. Now there's this great t-shirt that I saw in Atlanta a couple months before the president was elected. It had a picture of King and said the dreamer. It had a picture of Obama and it said the dream. And Dahlia, you and I felt that, right? When we were in the Oval Office with the president seven years ago, and he said, one of my priorities for this council is that it takes on interfaith service and that it focuses on, on young people and it brings people who orient around religion differently together to work on our common problems because that's the definition of America. It also happened to be who Barack Obama was in Chicago in the 1980s, a young interfaith leader who gave up a job at a New York bank to come to Chicago to work under a Jewish mentor to bring Protestant, Catholic, and Muslim groups together to run job training and educational enrichment programs. We worked for an interfaith leader. We work in a country attempting to be a cathedral of a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. It is a stunning privilege. It is a stunning privilege. I wanna bring up four colleagues and friends who are architects of religiously diverse democracies on their campuses for our panel presentation. So Chris Stedman at Yale, Varun Soni at USC, Andrea Whistler at Georgetown, Daniel Roth at the Pardis Institute of Jewish Studies. Thank you very much. We're gonna get into our panel. <laughs> Let me just remind you that we're gonna have some question and answer time at this panel. Um, I'm just giving you this, you can sit down. Yes, it's not meant to prevent you, thank you. Uh, but you do need to write your questions down. It allows us to move a little bit more quickly and uh, it allows everybody to participate. So, these are, uh, these are terrific people. Um, many of them I've known for years. Chris happens to be an alum of IFYC. Varun has paved the path that I, uh, that I and many others walk, so I'm, I'm thrilled to welcome you here. Uh, I will let you all read their bios in, in the paperwork, uh, but I'm gonna ask a question that allows you to register your story first as well. Um, why don't we just go straight down the line? Andrea, I'll ask it to you first, and we'll just go straight down. So my first question for you all is, what brings you to interfaith leadership work, and what, tell us what you do on campus. What does your role look like? I imagine there's a lot of people in the audience that are like, wait a second, I can get a job in this? I can, I can do this professionally? So what brings you to this? And what do you actually do? Thank you so much. I, it's really an honor to be here with all of you today and to be able to share some of my thoughts. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what brought me first to this work. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I had the great honor of going to World Peace Camp. And my students always laugh when they hear that because they said, of course you went to World Peace Camp when you were 14. Um, but at at that point in my life, I really, I got to meet youth from all over the world, from a variety of faith traditions in rural Maine. And we spent four weeks together there. 
and that to me really helped me understand faith and religion to be um, to be something that was a part of so many people's lives, and uh, that inter about about what interfaith work was, right? So just meeting those people helped me to get a sense of of various faith traditions. This was a really grounding experience for me to learn about faith, but it was as a college student at the University of Notre Dame when I took a course in liberation theology. And I'm a Roman Catholic, and I really learned through that course with Professor Matthew Ashley how not just about faith and religion, but how faith and religion could be really for full human flourishing, for social justice. And I, I really started to be able to connect religion, not just as something that nourished my heart and my soul, that could really connect my head, heart, and hands. And I really bring that to, me, um, to now to my job as uh, executive director of our Center for Social Justice at Georgetown's campus, in which we serve as a hub for student engagement in social justice work. So that is community-based learning, community-based research, volunteerism, community service, and at Georgetown, Bringing a faith that does justice, no matter what, no matter what faith you have, is really a part of our tradition and our values. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. To the organizers, uh, very grateful to the panelists. Um, especially grateful to my friend Ibu Patel. I look at Ibu as the person I could have been. <laughs> he's uh, smarter than me. Uh, he's a Rhodes Scholar. He's more interesting. He's a better speaker, a better writer. My wife tells me he's better looking. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but for me, this is the aspiration. So thank you, Ibu, for including me. Um, you know, listen, like Ibu, I, I, was, pro I was part of the 1965 Immigration uh, Naturalization Act um, experience. My parents immigrated to the United States, and I was raised as a first-generation immigrant in the United States. And it was difficult growing up as an Indian American when we didn't have any public uh, public sphere role models. We had Deepak Chopra and we had Apu from The Simpsons and that was about it. So uh, I often struggled to figure out what it meant to be Indian and American, what it meant to be a Hindu living in a predominantly Christian country. And the person who really helped me think about this was my grandfather who I lived with. And my grandfather's mother, um, uh, my great-grandmother was very close with Kasturba Gandhi, who was Mahatma Gandhi's wife. She was one of the leaders of the Indian nationalist movement, so she would go to jail with Gandhi, uh, with Kasturba Gandhi. And my grandfather grew up around Gandhi, sitting on his lap around Nehru, around the leaders of the Indian nationalist movement. So he would regale me with stories about Gandhi, who was essentially leading an interfaith movement in India. He would regale me with stories about how we can think deeply about meaning and purpose and significance and connect that with social justice. And so at a very early age, I had this idea in my head about what it meant to be Indian American. Oh, Gandhi is what it means to be Indian American, Hindu, etc. And when the film Gandhi came out, it gave us another public sphere role model uh, in, in the United States, other than Appu from The Simpsons, where uh, I felt great pride in sort of the connection my family had with Gandhi and, um, and the connection um, that the American Civil Rights Movement had with the Satyagraha campaign in India. In college, I went to, um, I, I lived for a semester in a Buddhist monastery, and I met the Dalai Lama for the first time, and I, I've been very fortunate to spend a lot of time around him. He is also leading an interfaith movement for uh, social justice. My wife is from South Africa. Uh, her family members worked in the ANC, as um, people don't know the Indian history of the ANC, but uh, they worked with Mandela, and he was also leading an interfaith movement. So when I went up to become Dean of Religious Life at USC, I didn't think I had a chance. All my colleagues around the country are ordained Protestant ministers. I'm a non-ordained Hindu attorney. But I think these, these experiences I had uh, growing up gave me a model where I could think deeply about this connection between spiritual and social liberation. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to echo my panelists' gratitude for the opportunity to be here and share my thoughts with all of you. I'm also very eager to learn from my fellow panelists and from all of you here uh, this morning. So what brings me into this work, um, like others on this stage and others who have spoken this morning, the only way I really know how to answer that question is by sharing a little bit of my own story. Um, and for me, I grew up non-religious. Um, religion was not a part of my life, but I converted to Christianity when I was 11 because I was looking for a community that oriented around building a more just world and these sort of questions of meaning and purpose that so many of us struggle with. And they gave me a sort of language and a framework for unpacking those and for acting um, in service to make the world a better place. 
I went to a Lutheran college in Minnesota, Augsburg College, and there I was really challenged to think about what I believed, why I believed it, and how that intersected with the way that I moved through the world. And it was through that process that my Christian professors really challenged me to look at my beliefs and my affiliation, and I realized through that process that I was not a Christian, that I had become a Christian because I was looking for that kind of a community, but not because that was what I believed, and I'd always really sort of struggled to feel like I fit in this space um, because I had grown up non-religious and it just wasn't the way that I saw the world. But I lived in that tension for a number of years, feeling like I didn't know how to relate anymore once I realized I was an atheist and, uh, and non-religious, I didn't know how to relate to people who were religious anymore. I, had, I felt like the only way to engage religious difference was through um, challenge, through argumentation, through disagreement and conflict, or through avoidance, through uh, sort of adop adopting a don't ask, don't tell approach to religious differences. But I was challenged eventually to rethink my approach to religion, and it was actually largely through the work of IBU and Interfaith Youth Corps that I was challenged to do so. And I was fortunate to, enough to have the opportunity to eventually intern and work for the Interfaith Youth Corps. And when I was there, uh, Ibu actually pulled me aside at one point and he said, now Chris, I don't want to tell you what you are, what you believe, uh, but you've been sort of saying you're not religious, you're an atheist, and those things certainly are true. But I wonder if you um, connect at all with humanism, if this is something you've heard of, if this is something that resonates with you. And I hadn't heard of it. That was the first time I had heard of it. Um, and so I looked into it, and for the first time I found a worldview and a belief system that really, in an affirmative way, expressed what I believed and gave me that framework and that language to articulate my desire to build a more just world. And so because of that and because of research from folks like Robert Putnam and David Campbell who talk about uh, religious communities as a way to connect people and help them become more civically engaged, I became a strong believer in the idea that non-religious people need similar support and resources and community. So I went to work for the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard and now I serve in a similar role at Yale where I help offer support and resources for non-religious, atheist, agnostic, and humanist students. But a big part of that work, it remains connecting those students and our community with the religious communities around us and finding ways to be in the world together and build justice together. I'm the odd man out because I actually do not live in America, despite my accent. I grew up in upstate New York in Syracuse, but as a child, there we go, uh, spent a lot of time in Georgetown this week, which was a real intractable identity conflict for me. Um, so I, as a child, moved to Jerusalem with my family, and within the first three weeks of uh, being there, there were three people stabbed and killed on my walk to school. And it created with me a real sense of fear and I started having this recurring dream that I wrote down and shared with some people that I was driving in a car with my family and we were stoned. And instead of running away or shooting, I jumped out of the car and I started running after the Palestinian boy who was my age. And I just went over and I said, I want to understand why you just threw that stone at me. And strangely enough, as dreams, as dreams can go, we went into the house, I became friendly, and I got to know their family. And I woke up and I felt that without understanding who is on the other side of that stone and why are they doing that, my fears are going to overcome me. After high school, I enlisted in a joint army yeshiva program, as, as are some of the options for, uh, for Israeli Jews. And there, in the very first week, I was taught a very important lesson about religion and interfaith. We were given a piece of Torah, of Talmud, and we had a disagreement between two different rabbis. And the rabbi asked us, who do you think is right? Abaye or Rava? Two rabbis in the Talmud, 18-year-olds not wanting to express our opinion. We didn't know what to say. And he yelled at us and he said, you are all spineless chickens. Who do you think is right? So we raised our hand and we said, Abaye. And he said, and did you think Rava was a bozo? And we didn't know what quite to say. But at that moment, we pulled a muscle in our brain and we realized that our faith was about understanding contradictory truth. And that same way we read text was modeled to us by our rabbis, Rav Yehuda Mital, of blessed memory, who worked with Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin, 
may you rest in peace, in designing the Oslo Accords as a religious Zionist rabbi. And that was a tremendous role model for me to get involved in this work. Fast forwarding, I want to just share one very brief story. What brings me to this conference is not the president's challenge. What brings me to this conference is my daughter, Rachel, 11 years old, who challenged me. A year ago today, I went with her to a massive interfaith dialogue gathering on the eve of Yom Kippur and Eid al-Adha, the most sacred days for Muslims and Jews. There was terrible violence taking place in Jerusalem that week. It was a huge gathering. Ten people showed up. My daughter turned to me at the end of the gathering. She said, Abba, you know this isn't going to solve our problems, right? And I didn't have a good answer. And my life here is to try to answer my daughter's challenge. And I do that in two ways. First, as an academic, I teach a course on religion and peace building at Bar Ilan University, a major university where we have about 60 MA, PhD students studying about interfaith, bringing interfaith practitioners into mainstream Israeli academia. And two, I currently oversee a new coalition of all interfaith organizations around the country, bringing them together with intrafaith and community mediation uh, centers from around the country in an attempt to create an awareness week around the values of constructive conflict, adab ikhtilaf in Islam, and makhluk at l'shem shemayim disagreement for the sake of heaven. So. Thank you. Um, I asked each of you to go for two minutes. Uh, I don't think any of you kept that, but I kept listening because it was so good. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. So I'm going to ask each of you to go for about 90 seconds on this. I want you to, you can do these together, you can do them separately. I want you to either name a significant challenge, uh, Daniel jumped right into it, thank you for that. Either name a significant challenge that you are facing and how you are facing it, or tell us about a great program that you're running that you think are gonna be helpful to others. It's gonna be helpful. And why don't we just go Andrea and straight down again. 90 seconds, by the way, is a minute and a half. I think a significant challenge for us is that we need to see social justice uh, and the creation of a more just world as intersectional. So all of our identities need to come together in this work. And at Georgetown, which really supports interfaith dialogue, interreligious understanding, I feel like I can have those conversations with my students about their racial identity, their ethnic identity, their sexual identity, and their faith identity. And really having the students really bring them together in the same conversation and, and trying to model that for looking at how our movements need to do that too. We heard from Dahlia that racism, Islamophobia, affects every single one of us. So we've tried to do that in a program, one of our programs through our center in collaboration with our Office, in, office of Mission and Ministry called MAGIS. And it's a program, MAGIS in Jesuit parlance means the more or the deeper. And we have about six alternative break trips that we um, specifically intentionally partner with campus ministry. And a chaplain goes on one of those trips. And you can, in the next session, hear from some of our students who co-led our Deconstructing Islamophobia trip, which in which Imam Hendi, our Imam, was a participant in that trip as well. And so it's really about thinking about how our identities are intersectional and our movements can be intersectional in this work. Perfect. Thank you so much. By the way, uh, Anna, if we can get some of those. If there's questions, they can. Great. And I'll just take a look at them as we continue to go. Varun, go ahead. I'll talk about something that emerges out of the White House challenge. Um, Secretary King kindly mentioned one of our programs, Interfaith Ambassadors. I'll mention another one. Um, we have a group on campus called the OnStar Service Partnership. I believe they're the first uh, Muslim interfaith community service organization on any college campus. It came out of the President's Challenge. Every week our students meet with students of other faith traditions and go out and serve our neighborhood together. And what makes this so significant is that even though USC is a shiny campus, we're only two miles away from the largest homeless population in the United States. It's a physical distance that's close. It's a psycho psychological distance that seems much further. So by connecting what's happening on campus to our community by meeting with different faith leaders on campus, reading each other's texts, and serving together. I believe that OnStar Service Partnership has provided a model of how we bring together the spiritual and the scholarly on university campuses and engage with the community accordingly. 
And this year, U USC is about to launch a university-wide initiative to help stop, uh, to help combat hunger and homelessness in Los Angeles. We're working with the mayor's office. We're working with professors and researchers at the different schools. And the OnStar Service Partnership is a part of that. So it's not just co-curricular on the margins of the university. Because of this larger university initiative and because of the work they did uh, coming out of the White House Challenge, they're now part of a citywide, nationwide uh, movement which does connect the service part with what is actually happening in the classroom in terms of research and teaching. So when I first went to Harvard to work for the Humanist Chaplaincy, I was brought on to, a big part of what I was brought on to do was to help our community get more involved in interfaith programs and initiatives on our campus and in our broader community. And one of the things that was clear to me early on was that our community was really passionate about hunger in our community. Um, more than a billion people in this world don't have access to enough food, and that's one in six Americans. And so I knew our community was passionate about that. It was clear to me that other communities were passionate about that, but I didn't know how to take that passion and turn it into action and connect our communities. And right around that time, I heard from a former minister of mine from when I was in high school, a Christian minister, who told me that he had also recently moved out to Boston. He wanted to get together to meet up and connect. And I was nervous about this meeting. I thought he was, um, you know, that it was potentially going to not go well, that we were going to have an argument of some kind, or he was going to be disappointed in me that I was now an atheist professional instead of a Christian, like he once knew me as. But he, as it turned out, we got together for coffee, and he told me that he was now working for this organization that helped organize meal packing events, primarily for Christian communities. And so I went out on a limb and asked if he'd be interested in working with a humanist community on doing this in an interfaith um, way on a college and university campus. And he was immediately very excited about the idea. And so because of this partnership between an atheist and his former Christian pastor, we were able to raise tens of thousands of dollars working in collaboration with faith communities at Harvard and service organizations like Phillips Brooks House, which we heard about earlier, to pack over 150,000 meals for uh, hungry children in our community. And at these events, I saw people come together in incredibly powerful ways to work toward a common goal and discover in the process their shared humanity and, and incredible shared values that they didn't know that they had. Really quickly, one challenge that I continue to encounter in this work, and that I know many others do, is that there's a growing population in this country, particularly among younger Americans, which is the nuns, the religiously unaffiliated. And I think it's challenging to, uh, when you're talking about a population of folks who really challenge our traditional understandings of belief, affiliation, identity, and participation, it's really challenging to figure out how to get those folks involved in this work. And so we're still trying to figure that out, and I'm, uh, I am learning a lot uh, in doing this work, but I'm always eager to learn more. So if that's a conversation you'd like to have today, please come find me. I'd love to continue it. So in Israel and Palestine, we don't have any challenges. Um, <laughs> that, that's why we invited you. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to give you the, yeah, the memo. Um, so really, the, the, the challenges are so immense, uh, especially around anti-normalization, with a real debate about, you know, do we um, first solve injustices and then build relationships, or do we build relationships and only through that can we be able to identify what the injustices are and work through them? So it's a huge challenge to be able to do any kind of interfaith um, dialogue or gathering. But what we've realized is that interfaith dialogue is ultimately a means to an end. It's not the goal. The goal, in our opinion, is how do we create space within our identities to allow in the identities of others. And we can do that in other ways, for example, through what we call parallel intrafaith. How can we create programming in B'nai B'rach, Tel Aviv, Ramallah, and Gaza all at the same time without them being freaked out? And I think it's through that that it's sort of like private therapy instead of couples therapy. It's a very American idea to bring everyone together all the time, but in the Middle East, you don't come together sometimes until things have really been resolved, but that doesn't mean we can't do significant change. And the other uh, solution that we work through is, again, is by bringing the interfaith organizations into coalition with mediation centers, we have essentially taken them from being on the sidelines of society to putting them at the top of the pyramid and making sustainable social change and making it into core identity. Terrific, thank you. So we have a, um, 
a couple of great questions here. One question is, uh, uh, how, how do people who live in less diverse areas, uh, how, do they, how can they join the interfaith movement? How can they do interfaith work when the presence of religious diversity is, uh, is either not, not apparent or, or far away? So I know that it, it, most of you right now live in pretty diverse areas. Right. So, but I know that Chris grew up in a less diverse area and worked in one for uh, for some time. Andrew, you might have as well. I'm going to ask Chris um, uh, if you can address that. How 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 might you have done this work? Mm. In Thank high you. School? Well, I think one thing that you can do, and there are a number of answers to this question, but one answer is that you can serve as an ambassador. You can take what you've learned in a more diverse space by being at a gathering like this and take the stories that you hear and bring them back to your communities and share them. I think about my sister who lives, uh, or until very recently lived in Moorhead, Minnesota, which is a less diverse community than the one I live in, and how she talks to her friends and neighbors about her brother who is a queer atheist and how she talks to her children about that and how in fact I had this really powerful experience when my uh, youngest niece was born where my sister asked if I would be a godfather to her uh, daughter. And I sort of jokingly said, are you sure uh, because, you know, uh, the whole atheist thing, is that gonna be cool? And she said, uh, and she knew I was joking, but she said something that I think is really powerful, which is that she said, I actually, it's not a problem to me that you're an atheist, it's actually an opportunity because you can model for my children and for their friends and for everyone that knows about you and about our family that you can have different beliefs that you can grow up to, that her children can grow up to believe something differently than she does because she is a, a really um, committed Lutheran and um, went to Concordia College in Moorhead and that's a huge part of her identity. And she says, you know, you can, my children can grow up to believe something different than I can, and they will still be a part of this family, they will still be loved, and in fact, it is our differences that make our family what it is, and that make our family so rich and so uh, wonderful for my children. And so I think that that's a story that she shares with people around her who maybe don't have the opportunity to meet someone who uh, has different beliefs than they do um, all that often, and she can be an ambassador for that story by sharing it with the people around her. So I think that's just one thing that you can do. That's terrific, thank you. I'm actually gonna, yeah, you can, you can clap for Chris. That's good. Thanks. Andrew, I'm actually gonna uh, give you a different question. Uh, so terrific question about uh, this sense that, that on some college campuses, um, there, there is this uh, understanding that, that tolerance or interfaith cooperation is only for people who are politically or religiously liberal. Um, one of the things I love about Georgetown is, is it has multiple pockets of students and thought, et cetera. So how do you at Georgetown, leading a center that's called social justice, indicate that interfaith cooperation efforts and welcoming efforts are not just for people who are politically or religiously liberal? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that we do is help not just students, but all members of our community, staff, faculty, all of the employees, our neighbors, our community partners, understand that this uh, social justice work and this interfaith cooperation, every single person is implicated. There's other frameworks that people might use in which you can find your way out of them, but, at, but social justice and thus social injustice, every single person has a role, no matter what your belief system is, how conservative or liberal you are. Um, and if people are, are thinking, okay, I, you know, I'm, not real, I'm not ready yet to go out of my kind of current safe space or maybe my community is uh, very singular and not yet as diverse. What I just always remember is how many points of view there are, for example, within Roman Catholicism, which is my background, and that you can start with intra-faith, right? Just looking at your own specific faith tradition and all the variety of points of, points of view right in, inside that one faith tradition. I, I love that, and, and uh, I, a private uh, concern that I have is that interfaith work is kind of conceived as circling religiously diverse wagons around particular points of view, and my sense is there's, there's, there's a lot of that that happens already. It's, uh, it's an important 
a type of work in a diverse democracy, but it seems to me that the type of work that is happening less is, is getting people who have deep fundamental disagreements on religious and political matters to figure out that they can do other fundamental things together. So uh, I love how Georgetown models this. Um, we have a terrific question about uh, how should we deal with quote unquote controversial or sensitive topics in interfaith work, ought these be uh, um, ought these be de-emphasized in, in order to emphasize things that are held in common? Um, ought these be at the center of the table? So uh, Daniel, as you were saying, you know, you never deal with this, and Varun, I'm sure you never deal with this also. So uh, I'd love the two of you to weigh to weigh in on this. I think it's like any type of process of building relationship. You know, if we start off the first time you meet somebody on a date uh, talking about like major disagreements, chances of getting to a second or third date are gonna be pretty slim. But if you never talk about the serious issues, you're not in a deep relationship. So I think it's a question of knowing your timing, knowing your context. Great. Varun, how have you done this at USC? Well, I do believe that one of the roles that religious life and interfaith can play on a college campus is to be a prophetic voice, however we want to define it. That doesn't have to be theistic, but it can be a voice of social justice, a voice of ethics, a voice of emotional intelligence, a voice of empathy and compassion. And in any given, uh, in any controversial topic, there is a need for that kind of approach. So um, what I was somewhat disappointed in last year is when we had all these conversations on our campus around uh, diversity and inclusion. I, I led the task force that addressed them. Um, there weren't a lot of religious voices or dissenting voices at the table. We created a committee that included that. But I think as we think about our college campuses moving forward, as we think about issues of uh, inclusion, campus climate, diversity, access, opportunity, et cetera, I do think there is a prophetic element that religious students, interfaith communities can and should be bringing to the table. And that helps situate interfaith on campus, like I said earlier, not on the margins, but in the center as part of a strategic vision for a university. So, Varun, I'm gonna push this just a little bit, right? Um, uh, just as in our, we all know this, that there is not a single definition of justice, and if you use the word social justice in a room and nobody disagrees with your definition, you're not in a diverse room, right? So if you use the word prophetic vision and everybody shares it, you're probably not in a diverse room. So what do you do when person X says, because I am Catholic, I have a prophetic vision about X issue, and somebody else says, ouch, because I am this kind of person, your prophetic vision is a violation of my identity. Yeah, so that's great. I, I, I don't think there is a single prophetic voice. We all have our own voices, and we all interpret our traditions, and we all interpret the same traditions in very different ways that make sense for who we are. So I agree, there has to be a diversity in that context, but for me, that's an example of free speech on college campus working, not an example of it not working. And I think what interfaith pedagogy and methodology allows us to do is to move the conversation just beyond the disagreement into the experience of the person. So yeah, you could have someone who's Jewish, Christian, and Muslim in a room, they will disagree on the nature of Jesus, and that could be the end of the conversation. You know, one could say he's a great rabbi, a great messiah, a great prophet. Uh, but uh, if you start talking about how, you know, your relationship with Jesus impacts the work that you do, how you feel when you pray, uh, what does love or mercy look like to you, then suddenly you begin to personalize uh, another person's story. And that is a unique opportunity on a university campus. I, I, was, I started off as a professor of religious studies because I thought that was the way to get people to know about each other, to increase religious literacy. But what studies show is that even more effective is actually getting to know someone of a different faith, not just, um, not just studying about a different faith. And I think that is the opportunity we have uh, in interfaith and religious life that I didn't even have in the classroom as a professor. Great enthusiasm for that, thank you. Okay, we have a, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, I wanna end on the, the note of hope, right? This is the President's Interfaith Challenge. This is happening because President Barack Obama thought that this was important, and hope was the major theme of his campaign, and one of the things that he stressed when Dolly and I were with him in the Oval Office with the Faith Council seven years ago was hope is an action, right? Uh, um, uh, you campaign on the poetry of hope, you govern, uh, on the actions of hope. So what are you doing, or what are you seeing, or what are your students doing that currently is giving you the most hope? Why don't we start with Daniel and go down the line this way, unless you don't, unless you wanna think about it for a second. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to go. Okay. Um, 
So the truth is I actually want to answer it slightly differently. Instead of the programs that I'm doing, I actually want to answer that what gives me hope is my faith and my tradition uh, to move forward. And I'll, I'll, I'll just share that 20 years ago, I was sitting in, uh, in services on the Sabbath, and somebody came up to me after services and said to me, how do you know that the prayer book has a sense of humor? And not knowing what to answer, he opened up and it says, you see the very last line of uh, the service says, Torah scholars increase peace in the world. <laughs> I took it as a personal offense. And my journey since then has to been to prove that the rabbis don't have a sense of humor at all. And that I really, for me, my tradition constantly reminds me that it's a charge. I have no choice. Like religious leaders have to go out and increase peace in the world. And I see it as a prayer that may Torah scholars, may religious leaders go out and increase peace in the world. So that's what gives me hope. I, um, what gives me hope is, you know, I, I really loved that last question on the hard conversations. I love the difficult conversations, which may be why I'm not getting a whole lot of second dates now that I think about it. <laughs> um, but, but really, that's actually what gives me hope is these really difficult conversations is that we are able to have them. I think that was one of my biggest fears before I really got involved in interfaith work was, are we going to be able to have these conversations that can feel so hard in these spaces? For me, as a queer person, as an atheist, you know, there are aspects of my identity that come into conflict with others' identities and that make some conversations really hard. But I've been involved in this work now for the better part of a decade, and not only are we able to have those conversations, in fact, I find that I have those conversations best and that they have the most powerful outcomes in these spaces where I'm forging these meaningful relationships with people. And I think about this um, all the time because, you know, for me, what brought me into this work is my story. It's very personal for me. And we've heard that from others up here. This, for, for so many people, is deeply personal and it means it's gonna be hard. But I find that I am most able to have the sort of deepest and most meaningful conversations with people about these things that are so hard because we've built this trust and because we share this commitment to building a more just world. So what gives me hope is that we're able to have those conversations, we're having those conversations, and I encourage you all to do what you can to bring those conversations back to your campuses because they're really, really important. So thanks for what you're doing. That gives me hope. Thank you. Um, for you know, the better part of 100 years, we've been debating personal identity formation in terms of nature versus nurture. Are we the product of our genes or are we the product of our environment? And that really plays out on a university campus between sociologists and biologists, et cetera. But the thir you know, as, um, as Secretary King told us, we, are not, we don't have any agency with nature or nurture. We don't choose where we were born and we don't choose how we were raised. Where we do have agency is not in nature or nurture, but in narrative, in the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. So what gives me hope are the stories of my students, the stories that I see every day, the stories that they tell about themselves, about their faith and about their world, stories of hope and reconciliation and engagement, stories of empathy. Uh, at USC, I've seen Indian students and Pakistani students come together after the 2008 terrorist attacks in Mumbai, embrace each other, light candles, read from each other's holy texts. That wouldn't happen in India or Pakistan, but it happens right, on, right here in the United States on our global diasporic campuses. I've seen Chinese and Japanese students doing fundraisers together for victims of earthquakes. That wouldn't happen in China or Japan. I've seen Israeli and Palestinian students telling new stories about a region that isn't just about conflict. These kinds of stories can only happen, I think, on university campuses. Uh, there are stories about how our faith can be part of a solution to the world's great crises and not part of the problem. So um, I want to keep hearing these stories uh, from my students, from all of you out there, because those are the stories that give me hope. I'm going to actually draw on a really specific moment last week that I had um, about something that gives me hope. Um, um, I think it's so important to remember that faith and religion, it's a dynamic, it's a dynamic living tradition. It's a dynamic, living, evolving process. And our interfaith understanding, our interfaith work can always be pushed forward and we can learn more. And it's this idea of learning that I want to draw on. On this last week, I went to uh, my first puja. We have our first Hindu uh, uh, chaplain at Georgetown University and they had an open house for their services this past weekend and so I decided to go. And the hope that I drew from the students, they were, they were packed into this room, 
diverse students in this room and how excited they were, see, they were to see me there and the, their willingness to go deep in their faith tradition and to reflect on what it means to live their faith of Hinduism for justice was just unbelievably hopeful for me. Thank you. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess that I'm, the moderator asked that question in part because he wanted to answer it <laughs> and to listen to all of your answers. Uh, but so thank you for all of those. Uh, uh, and I, I just want to note that, uh, uh, you know, Varun, you talked about the Hind Swaraj movement in India as an interfaith movement. You talked about the struggle in South Africa as an interfaith movement. The civil rights movement in the United States, also an interfaith movement. And six weeks ago, uh, we commemorated a really important moment in Chicago, which was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s March for Fair Housing in Chicago on August 6, uh, 1966. I brought my kids and we walked down the same streets that King and 700 marchers walked down. And I looked around and I thought to myself, 50 years ago, there were 5,000 people who came out to spit to hurl racial slurs, to throw bricks and stones at King and his colleagues who were marching. King got hit by a brick, went down on one knee, blood pouring from his head, stood back up and kept walking, right? So what's, what's hopeful about that? Right? Why is that not just a stain on American history, stain on Chicago? Part of the reason I went was because I wanted to know. And some of the people who marched with King were there. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Ambassador Carol Mosley Braun, and what they talked about was how that moment galvanized a movement in Chicago that 20 years later elected Harold Washington, right? And that a young man f graduated from Columbia University and left a, a cush job at a New York bank, had come to Chicago to be an interfaith leader, and every barbershop, every home, Every church he went into, there was a picture of Harold Washington. And he thought to himself, this man is giving a lot of hope to folks. This man is bringing people together in new ways. I want to be a guy like this, right? And the most unlikely story, literally in American history, the son of a mother from Kansas and a dad from Kenya who grew up in both Hawaii and Indonesia decides in Chicago that he is going to be a signal American leader who brings people together in profound ways. And in so many ways, if it wasn't for the slurs and the spit and the hate and the bricks of 1966 and the people who saw it and said, we can make a difference and did that Barack Obama, there wouldn't have been an Obama, right? And so I feel like I owe something to those people. I am in this country because of those people. The 1965 Immigration Act was deeply linked to the civil rights movement. I owe something to those people. They have run their leg of the race of what it means to build a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. You know, we're up next. It's our turn. What a privilege. Thank you to the panel. On now, okay. Um, back again for a few announcements. Uh, listen up. First of all, I've never heard you all be so quiet on Q and A. I know all of you, so this is how it's going to work. There's um, notes in the back of your welcome packet. I'm running around with pens. We're going to do a Q and A again in the closing plenary. Raise up your hand. I'll pick it up and bring it back to the stage. So I know you're not a quiet bunch. Been with you too long. There are, I just want to remind you again, there are uniquely lunch sessions this year for the first time ever. Get through your agenda and look at what's available. I hope that you will check those out. Um, also, many of you have been asking about the 2013 and 2014 certificates. All of you who are supposed to pick one up have been notified. So those folks know that those are at registration. Pick them up 
after the closing plenary. If it's an issue before then, please just stop by. They'll take care of you. Um, please just also remember that we are, this closing plenary is really exciting. I can't wait to see you all back here in your seats at 1.30. I also want to note we have shuttles, and um, it's listed in the welcome packet what times those are. Just check that out, but it's picking up from here and going to the Noma Gallaudet Metro Station. Please don't forget your luggage. I've had that happen before, so just, that's my... That's my last closing announcement. I won't be up here at the third one. I'm here in the audience. But I'll see you back here at 1.30 for a very exciting celebration of all of the great work we're doing together. See you then.